this commission promised Kenyans that it will endeavor to deliver free, fair, and credible elections. We sought to do this through upholding integrity and professionalism, engaging with stakeholders, being transparent in our, all our processes, addressing electoral malpractices during the election, including firing election officials on election day, and strict enforcement of the Electoral Code of Conduct. Election technology is an issue I must touch on. Ladies and gentlemen, this election marks a major milestone in the history of our great country. This is the first time Kenya has successfully deployed the Kenya Integrated Election Management System, what we now call KIMS. And this was done nationally to facilitate an efficient voter registration, candidate registration, voter verification, and transmission of results. The new system integrated the existing biometric voter registration, biometric voter identification, electronic results transmission, political party, and candidate registration system. Despite a few technical hitches in its usage, we successfully managed to adopt a new innovative way of integrating voter identification and transmission of results. This is something we have never done as a commission in the Republic of Kenya, and for that I would like to say a special thank you to each and every one of you for putting the confidence in us to deliver a credible election. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this year, like any other election year, we faced a number of challenges which we overcame in the quest to deliver a free, fair and credible election. You may all be aware by now that over 200 court cases that the Commission had to deal with, delays in procurement of election materials and services. But through all this, the Commission remained focused in delivering its mandate. There are many lessons that we have learned from this electoral cycle that we believe will strengthen our institution, ranging from how to mitigate against the late delivery of election materials to ways of quicker transmission of election results. Allow me to express our greatest gratitude to all those who contributed to the successful completion of the 2017 elections. First and foremost, I want to thank the people of Kenya, our number one stakeholder. You are entrusted, you have entrusted us this honorable responsibility just seven months to the election. To all our staff across the country and all our families for their sacrifices, I want to say thank you very much. To the staff, you have worked long hours and sometimes for gold sleep, particularly over the course of this week, to ensure that all the necessary steps proceed seamlessly. The overwhelming majority of you have demonstrated our core values of transparency and integrity. For your sacrifice and dedication, I and the country in general owe you our recognition and gratitude. And we are truly proud of all of you. All our stakeholders, including political parties, civil society organizations, candidates, state agencies, I believe that you will all agree with me that the Commission has been accessible and available to discuss issues of concern or that require clarification. In line with the Commission's policy of transparency, we have held numerous consultative meetings for which we express our appreciation to our international observers and partners, especially the African Union, United Nations, IFES, Qatar Center, NDI, Commonwealth Secretariat, East Africa Community, IGAD, European Union, and we are grateful for your support. We wish to express our special recognition to the election management bodies within the East African Community, that's Ghana, South Africa, Namibia, and especially my dear friend, Professor 
at the near Jega of Nigeria for your wise counsel during this election cycle. The Commission accredited a record of a number of local and international observers. I'm pleased to note that all the accredited local and international observers unanimously agree that the 2017 elections were credible, fair, and peaceful. We thank the observers for their preliminary reports and look forward to the final reports which will be incorporated in our post-election evaluation. We commend the local and international media for the role they played in ensuring the openness and transparency of the election. We would also like to thank you for your patience as we relay the information here periodically before, during and after the general election. According to the great American statesman, Abraham Lincoln, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. The average voter in the country spoke on the 8th of August. And today, we are honored to have been entrusted with this historic responsibility to give you the result of the five-minute conversation with that average voter. Before we pronounce the result of the presidential election, we wish to remind you of the results management path in accordance with the law. The first step in the determination of the result in the presidential election is the counting or the tallying of the presidential votes, which is done by the presiding officer at the polling stations after the closing of voting. The result of the counting is then filled by the presiding officer in form that 4A, which is signed and is a counter signed by the agents or candidates for political parties. Agents, candidates or political parties. Once form 3A is filled, then the presiding officer is required to key in the results in the GIMS gadget, scan the form that 4A, and send the two documents simultaneously to the constituency returning officer and to the national tallying center. The presidential result announced by the presiding officer is final. The constituency returning officer is then required to collect all the results from the forms that 4A, tally them, and record the aggregates of the votes cast in favor of each candidate in form that 4B. The returning officer then announces the result of the presidential election in respect of the constituency and electronically submits them to the National Tallying Center. The result announced by the constituency returning officer is final. Now, the only role of the commission at the National Tallying Centre is to collect and tally the results from the 290 constituency returning officers as recorded in Form 34Bs and then record the results in Form 34C. So that's our role, that's what we have been doing here. The chairman of the commission as a returning officer in respect of the presidential elections, then announces the results of the presidential election. Where a candidate has met the constitutional threshold in Article 134 of the Constitution, that garnering 50% plus one of the total votes cast and 25% of the total votes cast in at least half the counties, then the chairman shall declare such a candidate as having been duly elected as president of the Republic of Kenya. In, in this regard, Kenyans, by the powers vested in me, okay. uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm told the results have to be signed first, so I would like to thank you for listening to me. <laughs> and I'll be right back to announce the results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, you know, if I was still working in the place where protocol is a big deal, I would have been fired by now. 
but, but thank God I'm not working as a protocol officer, so the chairman will not fire me today. I hope he doesn't well, that was the chairman a... of Kenya's Electoral and Boundaries Commission there, laying the stage for the announcement of the results for the presidential election in Kenya, which concluded on a Tuesday. He started by outlining the stages leading to a successful election and thanked the Kenyan voter for turning up in large numbers. There were 19 over 19 million registered voters in these elections. Well, uh, that announcement of the presidential election is going to happen in just a few minutes, and Robert Nagy is on the ground there at the National Tallying Center. He's joining me now uh, with more of an update as to what has been happening at the Tallying Center. Robert, the Electoral Commission has made that announcement there. They will be uh, announcing the uh, winner of uh, the presidential election in a short time. What is the mood at the Tallying Center now? <laughs> well, you can probably hear it behind me. Um, that's one of joy, really, enthusiasm. Remember that people have been waiting in this hall for the last hour and hour, well, for the last hour and a half, really. Um, the IBC earlier on at about seven o'clock had made an announcement that they were going to come for this event, the final presidential results, uh, results, which would be released at half past seven local time. That did not happen. Now, when that announcement was made, it's not just uh, well, you can probably hear the joy that, and happiness that's happening behind me. That gives you a sense of the mood inside this auditorium. But I was just saying, when that announcement was made at 7 p.m. local time, it wasn't just the people inside here. And remember, you've got about 2,000 people who have been accredited to attend this particular event. It was all the entire country, you could say so because everybody was tuned in. And then the waiting game began. 7.30 p.m., local time arrived. There was no announcement. It was very... Robert Nagila there will be returning to that discussion uh, in just a moment. We've lost that link, but we'll be returning to Robert Nagila. That was the National Tallying Center. You're receiving pictures there from the National Tallying Center, the Bomas of Kenya in Nairobi, where the Kenya's Independent and Electoral Boundaries Commission is about to announce the winner of last Tuesday's uh, presidential election. Of course, incumbent uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta is widely expected to be the winner of uh, that uh, election. Well, let's go to Kisumu now, where Alexandria Majala is joining me. Of course, Kisumu is a stronghold of opposition leader Raila Odinga there. And Alexandria Majala has been keeping tabs on that election from Kisumu. Alexandria, what's going on in Kisumu? Well, Beatrice, currently we are in Kondele and we are standing by. There's a heavy police presence. Of course, everybody is still waiting for the official announcement. But what I can tell you is there's a heavy, heavy security. There's reinforcements have come in and they are patrolling up and down and they've been dispensed and dispersed in Kondele, rather. So basically, it's a wait and see situation for now, but there's heavy police, heavy police presence on the ground and we're just waiting to see what happens after the announcement. Beatrice. Well, Alexandria, yesterday, um, when the opposition uh, uh, people there announced that perhaps they would have wanted uh, Raila Odinga announced as president, there was a bit of commotion in Kisumu town. What has been happening today? Has that commotion died down? Well, basically today it's been calm and quiet. The streets have been largely empty following the announcement that the official uh, announced, following the announcement rather that the official statement from the IBC is coming out today. Everybody seemed to have disappeared sort of. Kisumu turned into a ghost town and we largely think that people have gone to their homes to watch from their homes to await the official announcement. So the streets are deserted. There's been no really incidents. There was a, a little bit of a crowd gathered earlier here at Kondele but nothing really to write home about. They were just milling about waiting to hear the news, probably to share the news together. So currently everything is calm and quiet and we are waiting for the news from the IEBC. All right, uh, Alexandria, do stay with us. We'll return to you in a moment. But let's now go to Robert Nagila again at the Tallying Center. Robert, uh, we did see there that there was a short uh, signing ceremony. Can you give us a clarity of what's going on at the Tallying Center? 
Well, uh, Robert Nagila, uh, unfortunately, is not joining us at the moment. But uh, just a quick recap of what is going on at uh, the Bombers of Kenya here in Nairobi. Uh, electoral officials, Kenya's electoral officials, are about to announce the winner of uh, Kenya's presidential election. The race was largely between President Uhuru Kenyatta and the leader of the opposition, Raila Odinga, the opposition, Nasa. Uh, well, the electoral officials are about to announce the results of that uh, presidential election. Officially, though, it, it, the opposition uh, has said that they will not be part of this process, but the uh, announcement of the results will be going on uh, nonetheless. In just a minute, the chairman of the Electoral Commission, Wafula Chibukati, will be making that announcement uh, as to who exactly has won this uh, presidential election. Now, the chairman uh, did say that there were 19 million registered voters, a record 19 million registered voters in this election. He outlined the stages that led to a successful election, of course, uh, keeping in mind that uh, international and local observers have uh, given this uh, election a clean bill of health. International observers largely saying that the electoral process has been free, fair, and uh, credible. Well, the country's election the Election Commission will be making the final tally or has made the final tally. President Uhuru Kenyatta is largely expected to be the winner of this election, having uh, received over 8 million uh, vote cast there. Uh, President Kenyatta is the leader of the Jubilee Party, and this will effectively extend the tenure of his mandate by another five years. Now, apart from winning the presidential seat, of course, uh, Uhuru's party has also won many legislative seats. Uh, the opposition candidate and veteran politician Raila Odinga has, however, claimed that the elections were marked by malpractices, an assertion that the Electoral Commission has said they will be looking into, but have largely said that their databases and that that um, election, electoral process has largely been um, mall practice uh, free. Of course, we'll be going back to the tallying center there uh, where the Electoral Commission will be making that announcement. There is a signing a ceremony by the uh, various presidential contenders there. Of course, Kenya's electoral, uh, the presidential election itself had eight candidates, but uh, there were two front runners the incumbent president, Uhuru Kenyatta, and the leader of the opposition, uh, Raila Odinga. Let's get more perspective of this Kenyan election, and I'm joined by Eric Momanji there. Thank you for, for joining us here on the program. Give us an overview of what you think has been happening today, of course, and we are seeing that uh, the Electoral Commission is about to announce the presidential results, but we have also heard from the opposition, NASA, who have said that they will not be uh, part of that event at the Bombers of Kenya. What do you think is going on here? Okay, what is happening, or rather what has been happening today was to... Um try to complete the tallying exercise at the National Tallying Center, which is at the Bombers of Kenya. And of course, uh, the development in the past two or three days since the vote on uh, August 8th has been that, the, that of contention, especially from the NASA coalition. So that was happening today, and uh, um, NASA have uh, categorically said they are not going to be party to this. Of course, they feel uh, disenfranchised from the, from the poll, but uh, the IEBC has indicated that uh, the poll has been credible and has been fair. And uh, therefore, what we know is that uh, shortly the chairman is going to release the, the results. And then from there, NASA had indicated that they are going to announce their course of action immediately the uh, uh, election, are, are, uh, the results are announced. I just want to come back to what they meant by they will not be part uh, of this uh, process at the uh, IBC, at the tallying center. By saying they are not part of this process, does that mean that the process will still continue regardless of what the opposition says? You see, what happens, um, the IBC is following the law. It's the law. And the law says that uh, it has mandated the IBC to announce the results. So if NASA says they are not going to be party to the election, to the, to the announcement, basically they are saying we are not in agreement with what is going to be announced. And uh, therefore, but that one is not going to stop IBC from announcing the, the results because it's the law. And the law is very clear when uh, it comes to the completion of the uh, voting uh, process.
writer Eric to stay with us here for a moment because we want to return to the National Tallying Center where Robert Nagila um, is standing by. Well, I do understand that Robert will join us in, in a short while, but just coming back to that whole uh, scenario uh, now and moving forward because the presidential announcement of, of that result is going to happen in just a few minutes. What happens next? What happens next is that um, the law is also very clear. In the event that uh, there are no contention, then uh, the president uh, will be, will be uh, inaugurated. In the event that there are contentions, um, then the law is clear that uh, you follow the procedure to the Supreme Court where you can uh, uh, lodge your complaints. And uh, what the law says is that uh, within uh, seven days of uh, announcing of the results, the party that uh, feels aggrieved has to go to Supreme Court and uh, lodge their claims, and that within 14 days of uh, lodging of the claims at the, at the Supreme Court, right. then the issue would, uh, be, uh, must have been heard and determined. If uh, there is no disagreement from the opposition then, and, and if everything goes according to plan, when do we expect the inauguration of the president? Naturally, uh, like in this case, we are expecting the inauguration of the president in the, uh, by the 28th of uh, this month. That is, the, that is when we are expecting that uh, inauguration. All right, so I just want to come back to what has been happening across the country because the country has largely been uh, violence-free. It has been calm since Tuesday, despite having a few skirmishes in, in um, uh, Kisumu yesterday. Uh, it has largely been uh, uh, violence-free, but nonetheless, businesses have come to a standstill. What's going on here? Okay, um, Kenyans are really reflecting what happened in 2007 where we had an election and uh, unfortunately it degenerated into violence. So people are just trying to be cautious. It's not that there's anything wrong. It's not that uh, there's uh, any violence that uh, is in the making or what have you, but people are just cautious. Uh, People are All right, indoors, we'll yes. Do hold okay. on to that thought because we are returning to the National Tallying Center where the chairman of the IEBC, Wafula Chibukati, is speaking. Let's listen in.
Total votes cast 342,337, representing 100% of the valid vote. Uh, the total valid vote cast 342,337, which is 100% of what, uh, which represent 100%. That means there were no oil votes. Kwale, count number 02. Registered voters 281102. John Ocott 424, that's 0.23%. Mohamed Dida 375.20%. Jagalata Kwajirongo. 254 representing 0.14%. Jafet Kaluyu, 348 representing 0.19%. Uhuru Kinyata, 43,694 representing 23.59%. Michael Wainaina, 319 representing 0.17%. Jafet Nyaga, 1,225 representing 0.66%. Raila Odinga, 138,565 representing 74.82%. Total valid vote, 185,204. That is 100% of the vote. Philippines. Count number three, 508,425 registered voters. John Ocott, Guru Ocott, 995, 995, representing 0.30%. Mohamed Dida, 555, representing 1.20%. Shakalaka Jirongo, 415, representing 0.13%. Jafet Kaluyu, 555, representing 0.17%. Uhuru Kinyata, 49,575, representing 15.12%. Michael Wainaina Maura, 393, representing 0.12%. Joseph Nyaga, 1,164, representing 0.12%. 0.36%. Raila Odinga, 224,129, representing 83.63%. Total valid vote, 3.7881. Sana River. And we are following that Kenyan election closely for you. That is the chairman of Kenya's independent and electoral commission there making the announcement of the outcome of the uh, presidential election in Kenya. Well, let's go to uh, Robert Nagila. He's at the Turning Center there and he's following uh, that uh, development there. Robert, can you give us a clear uh, indication what's going on, what is being announced at the moment? Well, thank you very much, Beatrice. What the chairman of the Electoral Commission, the IEBC, is basically doing is he's now giving the final results and he's going county by county. Now, Kenya is divided into 47 counties. So he's now on the third or fourth county. Still a lot more to go. That will take a while. Immediately after he finishes delivering the results of all 47 counties, he will then give the final tally of each candidate, all eight candidates, and then declare the winner. So that's what's happening at this particular moment, Beatrice. Robert, are all the eight candidates uh, present at the Italian Center as the uh, chairman speaks there? Well, I can't confirm whether all eight are here, but I know that I have personally seen four of them. President Uhuru Kenyatta is not present at this particular moment, and his main challenger, Raila Odinga, is also not present here at this particular moment. But I can't confirm that I've seen 
At least four of the candidates who took part in the presidential race here tonight with some of their agents, political agents, party agents present as well. Beatrice? Uh, right. Uh, Robert, do stay there with, uh, for us as you are uh, following that development at the Italian Center. I'd like to go back to Eric here because uh, the announcement of the presidential election is ongoing now. This is what's been keeping Kenyans on tenterhooks. What do you expect to happen from here on? Okay, of course, at the end of this uh, uh, announcement, uh, we are going to have the president. And uh, therefore, after the announcement of the president, then we are expecting the, the president-elect to make his uh, acceptance speech. And uh, naturally, we, were also, we are also expecting that uh, the uh, opposition or the, the candidate who lost to also call for a, a press conference and make a, a make a statement based on the results. Then, of course, uh, from there, after those statements have been made, then uh, the country will know the next course of action. And what we are expecting is that um, the kind of statements that are going to be made will determine the next course of action for this uh, country, especially in the next uh, coming uh, weeks. It has been a very competitive uh, e election, though, and th there's going to be definitely a lot of healing uh, to be done here. W what do you think is going to be the first uh, step of uh, an incoming president now that uh, this election seems to have caused a few uh, frictions, so to speak, between the government and the opposition? The first duty of any responsible president-elect will be to heal the country. And uh, this is not an easy task, but uh, it's a noble task nonetheless, and it's a task that has to be um, embarked on as a matter of urgency. And uh, we need uh, the president-elect will require to engage the country into a national dialogue and try to build consensus, helping the losers and the winners to, uh, to understand that uh, in this kind of engagement you'll only have one winner and that he's a president for all Kenyans. That will be very, very critical for the purpose of national healing. We did see, of course, uh, coming out of that tally, we did see that uh, the Jubilee Party, which is uh, the president's party there, had uh, members of parliament or from, the, from all corners of, of the country. Do you see, though, that uh, a lot of gains have been made over the last five years, over the last uh, ten years, since the 2007 uh, tensions? Since 2007 tensions, I'd say this has been the, uh, the biggest stride where, when it comes to elections in this country. It's the only election period where amid all the, the comp competition, we did not have violence. You will recall that uh, since the advent of multipartism in Kenya in 1992, we have been having violence and skirmishes in pockets of the country, especially in the Rift Valley and coastal regions. But this year you have not experienced that. That one is a major stride and a major indication that um, we are evolving and we are maturing as a nation and as a people, and uh, which is also a good uh, uh, plus, especially to the political class, because Ideally, all election violence have all been uh, uh, associated with the, with, the, with the political class and the political elite. But I think this, this year around, it has been a very good year for us, especially when it comes to elections and peace. We did hear, of course, as well, that um, there were a lot of new voters, uh, particularly younger voters, about five million uh, of them. Is that changing the out outlook of uh, the electoral process, though, in the country? Definitely, demographics really determine the kind of uh, leadership a country will have. And uh, when you're having a big segment of uh, the population, uh, will, that segment will dictate the kind of leader they want in form of uh, admiring their philosophies, admiring their manifestos, and uh, their, their track record. So for this case, yes, we had a, a big number, and uh, the big number were the youth uh, who have, uh, of course, uh, when you look at kind of uh, understanding and, and uh, synchronizing with the uh, presidential candidates, I think they were easy to, to synchronize well with the, with the incumbent president, uh, who is uh, the, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta. Yeah, if, and if you look at that as well, um, uh, synchronizing with the president notwithstanding, we, did, we have seen a lot of younger politicians now, you know, in their 20s, in their 30s being elected. Are, are we seeing a changing face uh, of Kenya, though, I, in Kenya's leadership, particularly given the fact that Africa is a young continent and, and, and the majority of uh, the African population now is pretty much under 40 years? 
that is very true. We have had a good number of uh, young people uh, joining politics as opposed to initially where we'll be having the oldies who will be joining politics probably after retirement or who would be very wealthy to finance a, a political campaign machinery. Now, it's an indication also that, number one, the youth are also... Um, uh, um, inclined to support one of their own because you remember they form the biggest uh, part of the of the voting system or the voting machinery and then number two we are also having a change in uh, in uh, thought about who a leader should be that initially our mental framework had been designed to think of a leader or a politician to be a wealthy person, to be an old person, and to be a male, not even a female. But things are changing, that even the young people, the youths, are getting endorsement from the constituents, which is a very uh, a big uh, step in our democracy. So how, how do you see, what, what's your view now of Kenya moving forward? Because as we see this younger demographic uh, coming up, we see the changing landscape I I in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the politicians reaching out to all corners of the country. What do you see the Kenyan landscape looking like moving forward? Okay, moving forward we are going to have a fairly um, nationalistic kind of thinking that uh, with this kind of uh, revolution, if you will, that is shaping up, we are likely to see a situation whereby uh, Kenyans are now going to vote people, not quite necessarily because of uh, the kind of money they wield or their ethnic affiliation or, or even because of the agenda, but uh, because of the kind of thought processes that they hold for the country. All right. Yeah. Uh, do stay with us, Eric. We'll continue that discussion. But first, uh, Tuesday's vote has been regarded as the most hotly contested in Kenya's history. It was also the second under a new constitution, which saw the emergence of more elective positions. Leslie Mirungu tells us more about the election. It's the sixth time Kenyans are choosing a president since 1992. This year, there were eight candidates for the top job, with incumbent President Uhuru Kenyatta and his longtime rival Raila Odinga, the front runners. Nearly 20 million Kenyans registered to vote, more than 45% of them under the age of 35. International observers praised the high voter turnout, up 36% compared to 2013. There are long queues here. It shows the enthusiasm that people have to exercise their democratic right. Um, there's been no incident so far. Voting seems to be going uh, smoothly, and um, I think uh, it's, a good, it's a good sign for Kenyan democracy. Although a few irregularities were reported at some polling stations, most voters say election day was successful. We can say that the processes, as we were able to observe, up to and including the counting of the votes at the polling stations and their transmission to the IEBC and so on, met the standards set by Kenya and the AU for the conduct of democratic election. One of the highlights was the use of new technology. For the first time, Kenyans could monitor the vote counting process online through the commission's web portal. The portal displayed all the positions up for grabs, including the presidency, governors, senators and legislative posts. A decade ago, Kenya was plunged into violence after the disputed 2007 elections. This year, security measures were stepped up to counter any disruptions, and at least 180,000 security officers were deployed across the country. Leslie Marungu, CGTN. And we are continuing our focus on Kenya's elections uh, on the program. Uh, today, the chairman of Kenya's Electoral Commission, Wafula Chabukati, is uh, making that announcement on uh, Kenya's presidential election results. But in the meantime, uh, let's look at other stories we are following for you at this hour. Now, talks between African and U.S. officials to review the African Growth and Opportunity Act, a Goa free trade deal, have ended with no decision. The forum in the Tobolese capital, Lomi, also revived a feeling on both sides that the free trade deal has achieved little since it was set up in 2000. AGOA allows for free for tariff free access on thousands of goods from 38 African nations to U.S. markets. President Trump's America First campaign has seen him withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, threaten to dissolve NAFTA, and seek to renegotiate the U.S. and South Korea free trade deal. But his administration has said little about Africa and had not previously mentioned the AGOA trade agreement. It is not clear whether the U.S. wants to change the deal before it expires in 2025 or extend it further. 
The African Growth and Opportunity Act, popularly known as AGOA, remains an important trade agreement for South Africa. So much so that the country waived its strict health standards and lifted its ban on U.S. chicken imports. America is now allowed to export up to 65,000 tons of chicken to South Africa, while the latter has nine more years to export a range of goods to the U.S. duty-free. Here's CGTN's Sumitra Naidu. The United States is South Africa's second biggest export market after China. Around a quarter of total exports to the U.S. is done under AGOA, which is mostly cars and agricultural products. And until the chicken spat, the two countries enjoyed an amicable relationship. The trade relations were there before AGOA, they've carried on after AGOA, they've benefited from AGOA. At the time when we were having the dispute, about 25% of our exports to the U.S. benefited from AGOA. In other words, the majority of what we exported technically had nothing to do with AGOA. But in order to keep the relationship intact and secure thousands of jobs under AGOA, South Africa ceded to U.S. demands and agreed to American chicken imports. About 85 percent of all chicken imports into South Africa come from the places other than the United States. So it wasn't a huge amount of the local market, but to American companies that were finding that their exports were not being treated equitably. Uh, it became a political problem. 3,000 people lost their jobs in 2016. The Poultry Association is warning of a further 20,000 jobs that could be lost in the next year. U.S. chicken products are adding to the flood of poultry imports to South Africa, but it can't be blamed. According to figures from SARS, total poultry imports in May increased 12.8 percent month on month close to 6,000 tons of chicken products into the local market. The problem that we have is there's now more dumped chicken in South Africa, not the same amount or less. So we've suffered roughly for every 10,000 tons of meat, roughly 1,000 jobs disappear in the South African economy. The government is looking at ways of assisting the local poultry industry. In the meantime, it's also trying to strengthen relations with the United States. AGOA will remain in place for the next nine years but it's unlikely to be renewed, which means that South Africa will have to start negotiating new trade deals. Sabine Ranado, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Travis Kalanick, the former Uber chief executive, is being sued by one of the company's biggest investors. Benchmark Capital, which owns 13% of the ride-sharing firm, has accused Mr. Kalanick of fraudulently attempting to fill board seats with loyal allies. The company is also being taken to court by self-driving firm Waymo, which has accused Uber of stealing aspects of its self-driving car technology. Let's get more now on this. Daniel Wrenches is joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, Daniel, it does look like Benchmark, a major shareholder, declared what is essentially a state of emergency at Uber. Give us the highlights of that lawsuit against him. At the top of those who control uh, the voting structure and the board at this uh, 60 billion US dollar valued company. And uh, essentially what's happened is in June of last year, uh, this uh, investment firm that controls about 20% of the voting power uh, allowed Travis Kalanick to introduce three new members of the board that he would control. At the time, they say in this lawsuit, they had no idea of what was about to hit the Uber in terms of its reputational damage. And they say that Kalanick knew exactly what was going on and that he deliberately obscured uh, the truth about these mounting scandals in order to secure these extra board, in order to control the board, and in order to eventually try to defend himself against being sacked by the company or having to be forced out of the company uh, because of the dynamics of the board. And on top of all that, they are now saying that they believe he's trying to do a Steve Jobs. What they mean by that is that Kalanick still has some control of the board and that maybe in the future, once they've unwound some of these scandals, Kalanick thinks he can come back. 
So essentially what these people are doing here at Benchmark Capital is saying, no way, we won't let this happen. We will throw the legal book at you uh, to try to uh, get you to leave the company and stop influencing things because we believe that you were responsible for this. Now, representatives of Kalanick's legal team say these arguments are spurious. They say it's riddled with lies and false allegations. So there you have it, a titanic battle at the top. Right, a titanic battle there at the top looming, uh, Daniel. So what impact exactly has this lawsuit had on Uber's business in the short term? Well, we've had a continuing erosion of the reputation of a, country, uh, a company that once was the darling of Silicon Valley and now it's fallen into disrepair. Many shareholders have been looking at what a, turn, a former attorney general has been doing to try to, uh, he's produced a report, particularly looking at some of the dysfunctions in the company and making recommendations to clean up the reputation. Um, but... Uh, some of the other sh shareholders not involved in this battle are saying the battle itself is taking precedence and we cannot clean up this company until this is resolved. Uh, there are some fundamental problems, for example, uh, with gender discrimination that have been identified by a former executive. There's an ongoing legal lawsuit about uh, allegations that Uber executives, including Kalanick, actually had the medical files of an Indian woman who was raped in an Uber uh, cab. She is still pressing for legal action. And of course, Google itself, or Alphabet, its parent company, is suing this company because they allege that Kalanick and others deliberately stole information about self-driving cars. So we've got a long way to go with this uh, company. And having this massive battle at the top is not helping them to restore their reputation. Well, there's a long way to go with the company there, Daniel. So what exactly does this all mean for the future of the company? Some are pointing to Viacom as a cautionary tale. It's absolutely a cautionary tale in what not to do in terms of public relations, in terms of handling things that have gone wrong instead of just sort of owning up to them, paying your dues and moving on. There's this ongoing a sort of a struggle to maintain control and not let these scandals affect the power base that Kalanick had. Many cautionary tales, but uh, the fundamental picture here is that Uber's rivals are starting to benefit from this. Companies like Lyft um, are doing extremely well, have a better reputation, and some of the more conventional companies are probably breathing a sigh of relief, saying this gives us an opportunity to get in on the act where Uber was dominating. Uh, another potential avenue here is that this company that is suing uh, Uber has been looking to SoftBank, the Japanese company, to sell its 20% its voting share to them so that it would have a much broader international reach. So there's the potential for Uber to, to change in very fundamental ways and become a company of the 21st century with all the corporate checks and balances. But right now, that's not happening. All right, uh, Daniel Wrench is joining us there from Washington. Thank you. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump recently explained why he's waiting on implementing steel tariffs. In the meantime, steel producers and steel users in the U.S. are lobbying the White House against each other on the issue. CGTN's Jessica Stone explains. Steel food cans. The canning industry calls them the most tamper-proof food packaging on the market. So when the American canning industry caught wind of President Donald Trump's pledge to slap steel tariffs on trading partners, it sent a letter to the White House saying, don't meddle with our metal. Quote, even a small increase would create further price pressures. But American steel producers pushed back, telling the White House, quote, if our industry continues to be challenged by market distorting foreign competition, it could become impossible to procure the steel we need domestically. While it helps the steel producing sector, it hurts the steel using sector, which is actually much, much larger. In fact, U.S. Commerce Department statistics show that for every one American whose job is to make steel, there are actually 16 people whose job is to make something with that steel. And what that means is that steel tariffs won't just be penalizing American trading partners, 
but American workers here at home. But Trump wants to penalize China for producing more steel than it can use, accusing their overcapacity of depressing global steel prices. According to the Chinese government, Chinese steel output rose nearly 6% in April of this year, above a previous all-time high set last spring. But the U.S. imports more steel from Canada, Mexico, and Brazil than it does from China, and the U.S. already has tariffs on Chinese steel in compliance with international law. The problem with Trump's proposed tariffs is that he's justifying them in the name of national security. And that's against World Trade Organization rules designed to guard against protectionism, says trade expert Carolyn Freund. So it's clearly not an issue of defense, it's an issue of jobs, and that would be the real threat to the international system, that we're using a policy incorrectly and breaking international rules. And this is the U.S. US government, the, the country people look to as the leader in globalization. The better alternative, says Freund, is to build on the G20 communique reached in Hamburg, Germany, getting global agreements to cut down on overcapacity in the steel sector instead of penalizing trading partners who are not part of the problem. Jessica Stone, CGTN, Washington. Qatar will allow visa-free entry for citizens of 80 countries to encourage air transport and tourism. And this comes amid a boycott imposed on the Gulf state by its neighbors. The new measure was announced on Wednesday with immediate effect. Qatar's tourism authority said the scheme will make the country the most open country in the region. Citizens of those countries, including China, the United States, India, South Africa, will get a multi-entry waiver at the port of entry upon presentation of a valid passport and a confirmed onward or return ticket. Depending on nationality, visitors will be allowed to stay for either up to 30 or 180 days. China state-owned National Tobacco Corporation has signed an agreement in Havana aimed at boosting Cuban cigar sales to China. Their accord will cover distribution and sales, but could later extend to production and technical cooperation. CGTN's Michael Voss has this report. China is already the third largest market in the world for Cuban cigars behind Spain and France, with the premium Cohiba brand proving particularly popular. And the first stop in Havana for the head of China National Tobacco Corporation was a visit to the Cohiba factory to see how the hand-rolled cigars are made. So far, Cuban cigars are only available for sale in 11 of China's 23 provinces. That could be about to change after both sides signed a letter of intent to increase cooperation and boost sales. <laughs> This agreement between Cuba and China includes commercial, industrial, and technical cooperation. More than 300 million Chinese smoke, according to the World Health Organization, almost a third of all the smokers in the world. And as people become more affluent, some are turning to cigars. Cuba already accounts for half of all the cigars sold in China. It's about 70% in terms of value, and both sides agree that there's an enormous potential for growth. In principio, lo que pretendemos is Our initial intention is to get Cuban cigars into the market with greater force. We will also collaborate in a distribution network to help educate Chinese smokers about the different types of Cuban cigars and tobacco. La identidad y la, el tabaco cubano. Habanos is a joint venture between Cuba's state tobacco company and Britain's Imperial Tobacco. Now, with this new accord, they're considering setting up a separate subsidiary with China National Tobacco Corporation, which has a virtual monopoly on all manufacturing and distribution of tobacco products in China. Michael Voss, CGTN, Havana. Let's now bring you a quick update of our headline story this hour, and we are focusing on Kenya's uh, election, which was conducted on Tuesday. At the moment, though, the chairman of Kenya's Electoral Commission, uh, Wafula Chebukati, is uh, making the announcement regarding the uh, presidential uh, result there. We can go now to uh, Robert Nagila. He is following that development at the, at the Tallinn Center at the Bombers of Kenya in Nairobi. Robert, can you give us an update as to what's going on? 
Well, Beatrice is still Beatrice very much at the same. What he's basically right. doing is he's giving the results so, of each presidential so, candidate from each county. Now, Kenya has 47 Maria counties. Uh, I think we've just done about maybe 10, 12 counties, so still some ways to go before he completes that. Now, once that is done, he's then going to give the overall tally of each candidate. Immediately after that, declare the winner. Now, the process that's supposed to come after that, I believe, is the winning candidate is then handed the winning certificate. So I'm not sure at this particular moment whether President Uhuru Kenyatta, who we expect to be declared winner of the 2017 Kenya presidential race will be here to receive that or this will be pushed off to another day. We know that he was at another function in uh, about 15 kilometers from our current position in the central business district here in Nairobi uh, where he was then supposed to address the nation immediately after this announcement was made. So we'll just have to wait uh, and see what happens immediately after the final tally is declared and the winner of this race declared. Beatrice? Right. Uh, Robert, do stay with us there for a moment. We'll continue with that discussion. But first, in studio with me, Eric is still here. Eric, I want to look at uh, the various uh, elections that have happened in the region in the, couple of, in the past couple of months. Rwanda has had uh, a pretty conflict-free election, presidential election there uh, in the last week or so. Ghana had one as well as uh, Nigeria. All incumbents uh, stepped aside when they were defeated in that poll. Given the standoff regarding Kenya's election here, has this had any impact at all on Kenya's regional standing? Uh, the standoffs are... Uh they're common when it comes to elections. Again, it's a competition. And uh, everyone, and especially if you are a leading contender, you expect that you're going to win. Uh, when it comes to our perception in the region, I don't think if this election will have a serious ramification as did the uh, previous uh, elections. At least from 2013, I think uh, we have, uh, the region is respecting Kenya. It has, yes, one or two uh, uh, parties may feel like, okay, this, um, the, the, the country has not stabilized yet, but you are an evolving democracy, remember. And uh, if you look at Kenya and, uh, and uh, Rwanda, if you compare the two and the kind of leadership, they are completely different. The leadership in, uh, in, uh, in Rwanda, um, if you like, it's, uh, it's that of a, a philosopher dictator, not so much in Kenya. In Kenya, we are having, uh, it's a liberal democracy, and uh, where the, uh, if you have uh, an issue with the systems, the, we have uh, robust court systems. So people are fairly free to express themselves as opposed to other countries in the region. So still, we, are, we, will, be, we will be looked at uh, carefully. But uh, uh, given the kind of peace that uh, we are experiencing now and the calm that we are experiencing now, I think we are going even to be respected more. We are looking back now at uh, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta's last five terms and what he concentrated on. What do you see him concentrating on, focusing on uh, in the coming five years? Well, in the past five years, the president concentrated on um, major, if you like, mega projects. And we saw the creation and the rise of the standard gauge railway from uh, Mombasa to Nairobi. And uh, we also saw the kind of um, electrification in the country through the last mile project and uh, uh, electricity and energy projects uh, coming up. Now, the president uh, in, in the manifesto and uh, when he went around the country, he indicated that he wants to complete the projects that he started. So we are going to see an expansion of the standard gauge railway and uh, the Jubilee government had indicated that uh, the project will move west from Nairobi to Naivasha and then further west to the port uh, city of Kisumu and to Malaba. So we are seeing the, pro uh, the president really concentrating on that. There are also plans to expand the uh, highway from uh, Mombasa, uh, Mombasa to Nairobi to make it a six lane, the president is also going to concentrate on on that uh, mega mega project as it were. That is when it comes to uh, projects, and uh, maybe another critical project he'll concentrate on is uh, electri electricity generation uh, from especially the renewable energy sector. So those are. Key
key that is going to concentrate on. But we are also going to see a, a situation where by the president and uh, they indicated this in their manifesto, where we are going to have um, the, the small and medium enterprise group um, moved to a, 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 a position of efficiency in a level where they can um, uh, uh, engage in services and production of goods that uh, can be uh, marketed uh, uh, regionally and even internationally. We are, we, are, we are going to see a lot of that. All right, yes. uh, Eric, we leave it there for the moment. But thank you very much for joining us here on uh, Africa Live. Remember, we are following Kenya's uh, elections for you there. And, of course, this brings it to a close. The chairman of the Electoral Commission of Kenya, Wafula Chebukati, is at the moment uh, making that declaration of the results of uh, the presidential election that was between the incumbent president Uhuru Kenyatta widely expected to win uh, this uh, election against his opposition rival, uh, former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. We will continue updating you on that development from Kenya's election in our subsequent uh, bulletins. For now, that's it on this edition of Africa Live. But remember, you can send your feedback to the contact on the screen and follow us on our digital media platforms. Thank you for watching. I'm Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. From me and the team here on Africa Live, thank you and goodbye. Ninety two point seven eight per cent. Michael Maura, one.